Yeah, the heart space is this, like, the ocean is terrifying, like open and wa open water. And so I feel whenever I start to encounter actual feelings that I'm, my first feeling was not at home. <laughs> like, I'm like, it's like being like a land, it's like being a land creature and then like getting dumped out of a boat. You're like, I'm going to die here. Welcome to another episode of What It's Like to Be You. I'm Josh Levine, your host. Today, I am sitting with a type seven named Sam Lewenberger, who I felt really privileged to have this conversation with because it was really fresh on the heels of a really powerful two experiences that he had that were um, tectonic shifts in his inner world. One is that he realized that he had been mistyped as a four and he's actually a seven. And the other, which happened about a week later, is a experience he had in a therapy class. Sam is a student in a therapy graduate program, learning how to be a mental health counselor. And he had a very powerful experience that kind of rocked his world. It's really a special and rare thing in my experience to see a seven be in a state of this kind of prolonged vulnerability and self-reckoning. <laughs> And I think Sam was really courageous to um, volunteer himself for the experience of this conversation, which is actually itself a thing that is interesting to unpack given the context of his type seven structure, which we kind of get into in the conversation itself. Something else about this conversation from a theory point of view that it was interesting is that Sam's typing, his full typing is, is a seven with a six wing 712 trifix and so type 7 being the type that gives itself the most permission um the in a sense the freest type and types 6 1 and 2 all three super ego types which are the most internally constricted in certain ways and so i found that a really interesting polarity which we explored at length in the later half of the episode one thing i'd like to mention is that when sam volunteered himself for this interview he sent me an email that was a series of thoughts about his reckoning with himself as a seven, um, a bunch of fresh insights. And he said, among other things, that life was taking him back to feeling school and that he used to think that he was a person really well versed in his emotional life, but actually he realized that he wasn't, he was just thinking about his emotions instead of really feeling them in the style of classic seven. His writing was really it really struck me and is the reason that I uh, selected him for this interview. And um, I asked him if he would be willing to make it available so that you can read it. And he did. So you can find it in the show notes. Um, I do recommend that you go and read it. It's uh, quite remarkable. He's a great facility with language and um, yeah, he's a really beautiful writer. So please check that out. Sam actually is a writer by trade. And in the show notes, you'll also find a couple of links to other pieces of writing of his, an essay and a collection of poems. All right. Without further ado, here is my friend, Sam. Welcome, everyone, to another interview. <laughs> and, and the second one around for me and you here. The sequel, yeah. The sequel, yeah. The second take, this time with the camera actually on. This, so, is, just, this is act two, Josh. This is, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, sometimes I've learned, well, whatever. Um, yeah, sometimes it's, That's you know, just so I've learned that it's I've learned that it's important to push the record button. It's one of my it's one of my learnings over the course of doing these interviews. Yeah. So um, we had gotten like 15 minutes into this interview, and we talked about your origin story, and we talked about in terms of the enneagram, we talked about you mistyping as a four, and now learning your seven, and that's being that's really fresh for you. Mm. And we talked we were about to start talking about this therapy session that you had that was really profound, mm. or actually more of a um, Yes, it was a therapy session, but you're, tr so you're trained to be therapist and you had this experience where you were um, playing in front of the class, the part of a client and something very uh, deep happened for you. Yeah. Um, let's, let's get there eventually. I just want to sure. set this up. So, so your full typing is, as you've recently learned, self press social, seven with six wing, seven, one, two, trifix. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Um, and you and that was a surprise because you originally thought you were four so sure. um i know you just did this 15 minutes book but can you um can you take us through it again so yeah. just enneagram origin story and um 
yeah, where you're at with it now. Yeah, sure. So I'll start with mistyping as a four. Um, so kind of a couple things were connected to that. One thing that we were talking about that I feel like is a helpful place to start is um, the object relations piece of the Enneagram and how um, the Enneagram Universe Group, Big Hormone Podcast, uh, I think was really impactful for a lot of people and hearing that object relations call, that series of calls with Courtney um, and sort of understanding your type at a deeper level. So for a couple of years, I had thought that I was a four. I think in 2018 was when I first got introduced to the Enneagram. Um, like a lot of people, read Road Back to You, really like felt hooked strongly into the type four description, identified with that, read lots of other stuff too, uh, pretty voraciously, um, just kind of, and listening to podcast stuff. I was working a blue collar job, like I worked for this guy who ran a lawn care landscaping business. And so I would listen to podcasts pretty much ad nauseum. Uh, when I was on machines, just because it helped me stay sane. Um, Cause I'm a people person. And so like, I would just be like, I can't figure out what I'm going to do next with my life, but at least I'm sort of feeding my brain, what should have been a head type kind of clue. Um, I'm going to just kind of keep like the hamster wheel of my brain spinning with Enneagram stuff because I couldn't get enough of it. So what happened um, is I kept confirming confirmation bias, I guess that I was a four listening to all this material. When I listened to that object relations call, what was really interesting is I identified really strongly with all of the frustration types. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that, but I remember hearing the stuff for seven where it's just like, okay, not getting the nurturing function, the stuff with the one, uh, not getting the supporting function met where it's just sort of like, uh, this is wrong. Like I, like I don't, or it's just like this sense of like, I wasn't exactly shown the, like, there's just this almost gut sense of knowing how things should be that I identified very strongly with that I thought, okay, four line to one. And then um, stuff with the four I identified with really strongly because it was this sense of alienation or just feeling like uh, you don't know how to like be a person. <laughs> um, like I remember like going through difficult periods of my life and it's funny that I discovered the Enneagram at a, like a point in my story where like, I just felt like a loser. Like my life just was not clicking the way that I had hoped that it would. Creatively, my life had flopped. Relationally, uh, same thing. Um, and I just felt pretty isolated. And so I was like, yep, this is this is straight up foreignness. Like, what else could it be? Um, and so, like, all of that was sort of leading me further and deeper, deeper down this four path. Um, I remember just, like, having conversations with people, just being like, I just don't get it. Like, I don't get, like, it was this feeling like I don't get, like, how you're supposed to, like, like my, like, I think there's that whole four. It's like fours aren't functional. Like I felt like I was like, well, I'm not damn functional. I can't like figure out what I want to do for my work. Um, like creatively, like I know what I want to do. And that puts my feet on the floor. That helps me get out of bed every morning. Uh, but like so much of my life just found like this profound uncertainty. And so that to me, I was like, okay, everything was just like four stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I got into another relationship and it was the first relationship I had been in for six years. And it was somebody that I could connect to about the Enneagram. Okay. And I was connecting to this person. It was weird because when you're in a relationship with somebody, I feel like, at least for me, I'm seeing parts of myself that I don't see when it's me as a single person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, a part of it is an on stageness where I'm like, and I think that's where type structure gets amplified, at least for me, because I'm somebody who has a tendency to want to perform. Uh, to want to like entertain and support. And so like, I'm going to show up that way in relationship. And so mm -hmm. I would hear myself starting to talk about stuff like the Enneagram. And this is something I've been aware of. And maybe you can even tell now I start talking kind of fast yeah. and sort of an energy and a momentum to it. And I would always catch myself like, okay, got to slow down, especially if there are people who don't know what the Enneagram is. It's sort of like, almost like all of a sudden I'm like this freak cartoon who's like talking about like, just like gobbledygook. Um, and so that like was a cue. I was like, oh, maybe I have a seven fix once I started to learn about the dry fix stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But never occurred to me that that could have been a core. That could have been yeah. my core type. So that was sort of a rambling version. I can kind of continue with it. I'm not sure if there's something that you've heard so far that you want to ping off of. Yeah, let's see. Um, so I want to actually set one more thing up here for this interview. Yeah. And that is the way, the way that it, ha it came about. Sure. So, so you reached out to me, um, and you and you sent me 
a an audition tape that was relentless <laughs> you sent me a 20 minute audition tape um which i watched after which I watched listening to of. your type 7 interview with ikram that's right that's Immediately right yeah. after i was making baked ziti josh and i came to this computer and i was like i gotta do this <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so you sent me that and then actually later you followed up and were like whoa 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 i just sent you this crazy thing you don't even have to watch it don't worry about it then later you sent me this long email that you wrote in preparation for your typing debrief session with David Gray, in which you were really reflecting on your experience of being a seven and all these new insights, which were fresh for you literally as of like within the last month. Yeah, right. Yeah, and I, and the email was, frankly, it was extraordinary. It was, a, a, it was an amazing, I, my experience, I think you're a gorgeous writer and you captured certain things about the seven in really beautiful language. And so part of what I want to do in this interview is just kind of quote yourself back to you and then unpack some of the stuff that you wrote. So um, given this thing that you just said, one of the things that I wanted to get into was you said that um, at therapy, this is you, at therapy, I'm good at generating a huge amount of mental energy to hover over pain. You can hear it in my voice. All of a sudden, I'm an auctioneer babbling at 1.5x speed. Don't slow down, dude. You might feel something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I'll say one other thing, actually. Let's see if I can find this quote. Um, I love this. Um, how are you feeling? I can yap all day across the surface of that question. If you're not a skilled listener, you might not even notice that I didn't talk about feelings. I blasted over them. My head is a jet ski. The heart is an ocean. Yeah. <sighs> What's happening to you right now? Uh, listen, hearing those words. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the heart space is this, like, the ocean is terrifying. Like, open, and wa open water. And so I feel whenever I start to encounter actual feelings that I'm my first feeling was not at home <laughs> like I'm like it's like being like a land it's like being a land creature and then like getting dumped out of a boat you're like I'm gonna die here <laughs> and so there's this feeling in my body and this is something I've become aware of more recently where it feels like it feels sort of like quivery, like you're just sort of like, oh, there's just this like, it feels like you're turning into goo. Like, I'm just like, am I going to hold together? There's something that is un like the word undone keeps coming up to me. Mm -hmm. There's something about the heart space mm -hmm. that makes me feel undone. Yeah. And th well, that's a beautiful word, too, and certainly belongs in the heart space. I love this word quivery too. That was my experience of like, I could feel the energy in my, mm -hmm. like, I, and I'm a pretty absorbed of, from an energy point of view person, but that was yeah. what I was experiencing from you in that moment. It was a sense of quivering. Yeah. Yeah. And we were talking uh, a little bit ago about how there's a difference between the way that you can get excited by an experience of like, um, talking about talking about feelings, talking about pain, experiencing pain, consuming sad music, sad movies, sad songs, um, yeah. and the experience of actually being with your own pain or, mm -hmm. or finding an exposed nerve in you that's really sensitive and having that get touched. Oh, yeah. Um, and let's see. Um, why, don't we, why don't we just do this? I, you had a recent experience in a in that therapy session. Okay, let's go there. Um, can, so you're training to be a mental health counselor. Sure. And you had an experience recently in a class that I think is really illustrative. So why don't you set the scene? Yeah, I will. Thanks. Um, so I got my typing back on a Saturday in July. It was the last Saturday in July. Mm -hmm. I was leaving on Sunday for a week-long counseling intensive. I'm training to be a clinical mental health counselor. At this 
this class was going to be a counseling techniques class. So what that meant, it was going to be experiential learning. So we, what we did is that we would review two core counseling techniques each day, and then we would um, see them demonstrated by professors with a volunteer from the class. Someone would play the part of the client. Uh, the professors would obviously be the counselor. So during that week, I had a chance to be the client in front of half of the class. It was during a small group exercise and, you know, kind of fun. Um, also did some one-on-one -on -one stuff with the person who was my, my counselor for the week. I, I love being the client. I'm good at it. It's fun. It's like I said, like pain is edible energy. It's sort of like you get to just get all of this attention from one person and you get to like, I guess it is that jet ski kind of thing, which I thought was like, I love to connect that way with people. And I always thought that was me connecting on a heart level. Yeah. So, okay. so, so what yeah. happened, <laughs> which is still a shock. Um, so what happened is the Thursday of that week, there were going to be two counseling techniques that I was really interested in being a client for. One was cognitive behavioral therapy, which is like, obviously like kind of looking at sort of your thoughts, um, automatic thoughts and, treating those thoughts and saying, okay, is this true? What are the core beliefs? Um, the other was Gestalt therapy, which is a body-based method of basically looking at the here, here and now, what's happening for you here and now in the moment, uh, using the body as an on-ramp to what's happening um, inside. Um, I was really interested in both, but I was just like, I had this momentum in me also like that, that morning I can remember I had so much energy in my body. I could not sit still because I wanted to be the client so bad. And what it was that carried me there were a couple of different things. But one of the things was I just wanted to just, I think I used this the last time we were talking. It was just like, I wanted to get blasted by whatever was coming toward me. I could feel like something was coming toward me. I'd been like started therapy myself like in April. And so like, I was starting to be aware of like what feelings actually were. And it was sort of like, I kind of want the test. And I also like this feeling, it's like a drug. It's like a drug. You're like, it's like dissolving psychological boundaries with people or with yourself is a drug. Um, and so like, it's almost like basically having the opportunity to be like, okay, like we're going, like, you're going to just, you're going to do this drug in like in a room of 20 people and uh, there's going to be all the stage energy. And so they're going to carry me on there. So the vulnerability part, I don't care. I mean, vul being vulnerable and that, and that way in front of 20 people, I just wanted to make sure I did it with integrity, that I wasn't performing outward. Okay. So, okay. okay. So I got to so what happened is this, is this on track? And I know that this is I, great. Yeah. 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 So what happened is I wanted to, I, I got up in front of the class for the first session and it was the de demonstration of cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT. And it's basically head tennis. Like you're, you're just kind of batting the ball back and forth. Um, it's probably the type of therapy that's least invasive. It's considered it's. And so there's a way that as a head type, I was, I was expecting, and this is what the dynamic became to sort of have this fun back and forth with the counselor, kind of push a little bit. I had a reputation for being a difficult client, uh, for, for reason at my program, which I sort of like reveled in. I was like, yeah, hell yeah. Um, it was just fun. It's fun to do that. And Can you say real quick, actually, that's a, what does it mean? For you to be a difficult client how is that word how is that being used in the context of your program so in my program you know it's so funny to me because like i'm like i'm just being honest and real like i'm not going to just like placate the, the counselor and be like yeah so like let me just sort of like go at your speed or not bring up stuff that um doesn't fit neatly into the technique or method that you want to have that you want to use that could be some of it it's also just sort of like pushing back on the therapist like i don't that's what friction i'm all about friction in these kind of conversations, I'm like, it's more interesting if there's a little bit of a, like a fight, you know? <laughs> yeah, I see. Okay. So, it's and like, generating that friction is exciting to you and is what makes the tennis oh, match fun. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And especially this person was kind of more passive, very like grounded, calm, like nine, one, nine wing one stuff. Okay. Mm -hmm, That's what mm -hmm. it felt like. Um, okay. And so I wanted to just get in the ring with both of these people and just go like go all the way mm -hmm. um and so yeah so i don't know why i got labeled as a difficult client but people would say that i was it was also like kind of like entertaining i guess people were like oh this person's just sort of like yeah. there's some energy to what they're yeah. doing mm -hmm. all right so the point is is that first session happened and there was some vulnerability that came up 
But like you can see in this, the first 10 minutes of this conversation, there's a way I can talk about difficult things um, without going into them. And you could feel a shift in a resonance where like, oh, wait, I'm like going to drop down into actual feelings. Mm -hmm. And that's the scary stuff. And I like touch the surface of that in the, in the cognitive behavioral therapy session, but I didn't have to go all the way down. Yeah, yeah. So I sweated a little bit. I emoted. People were hooked and interested. There was some adrenaline in the room, but I hadn't really gone off. <laughs> I hadn't really lost my shit yet. I love your uh, just awareness of the eyes on you and the way that your energy is impacting the room and the performative uh, feedback loop of it all. Yeah. As a as a set, like that's part of the drug, you know, and that's oh, part yeah. of the that's part of the fun. It seems like of you. That's why you volunteered for the experience. Yeah, pretty much. In a sense. Yeah. 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 Like, like I said, like, it's almost like being carbonated in your body. Like, I remember just sitting there that I, I was just like, it's going to happen. Like, I hate sitting for long periods of time, but I was just like, I was sitting in the room and I remember looking catty corner across the room at this guy that I was friends with. I was like, as long as, yeah. as long as Matthew doesn't want to volunteer to be the client, I'm freaking going to all be all over this. Like I already oh, had yeah. the line in my head. I was like, I'm going to go. Yep. 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 As soon as they say volunteer, I was like, I was ready. Like I'm already like stage crafting this. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm ready to just jump in. And so I get, so I get the moment I jump up and feel like, Whoa, damn, he really wants to do this. So I get up uh -huh. first session happened. Second session, man, entirely different. Ah, uh, within like two minutes, I'm, I'm just like done, you know, like I said, like, I'm just exposed. Like what, what happened? So one of the things like, so basically one of the things Gestalt's doing right off the bat is like, sort of like repeating the things that you say or looking at body language. And I'm not good at hiding stuff. And so if somebody's gonna play body language games with me and they're like, oh, you're doing this or that, there's a way that that disarms me. Okay. Because you're not playing, you're playing a different game. You're not talking about what I said. You're looking at the way that I am, the way that I'm being, the way that I'm yeah. showing up. Yeah, yeah. And so you're taking away my defense mechanism, my my skills, you're taking up, you're taking away all of my tools. That's what disarming. I don't have any weapons. Okay. So now I'm just a body and a heart. I'm freaking up in front of 20 people. And what happens is this person like basically identifies some polarities and things that I'm talking about of feeling like she's talking to me about loneliness. <laughs> and she said to me, Oh, she said to me, where's the loneliness in your body? <laughs> and I just said, yeah, everywhere, everywhere. Wow. And it's like, there's a, like when your soul talks, like you don't know, you're like, who's that? <laughs> Cause I don't see him that much. Um, taking your carbonation metaphor, which I love for a second. It's like it, CBT allows you to keep the engine that generates the bubbles going. And so there's yeah. fizz always happening and the more fizz, the better, but gestalt therapy, it's almost like the bubbles, they rose to the surface, they popped and what was left was just flat water. And you had to meet that. Yeah, man. So I just said like when you're hearing, it's like, it's interesting Therapy is creative in the sense that you're you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, and when you're It's like I don't know what I think till I say it. I think Flannery O'Connor had says that. Had said that. That's true okay. in therapy. And so when I said, you know, where's the loneliness? That's 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 the heart speaking too. And so it's very immediately just lost, like 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 got emotional. Um, yeah. And so what that kind of led further down to was kind of looking at a polarity. And what they mean by polarity and gestalt therapy, without getting too technical here, is basically just saying, okay, there are two parts of you that, that both belong, but one of the parts is one of, is you are pushing away that you don't want right. to identify with. Sure. All right. So there's a part of me that got up in front of 20 people that was going to be fun. It's going to be great. You know, it's going to be a show. 
Um, I'm gonna, it's gonna, I'm gonna show a little vulnerability. Yeah, that's fine. People are gonna love it. It's, it's gonna, people are gonna be hooked by it. Okay, there's gonna be something about it. People will like me more if I do this. I've done it before. It, I can do it again. Not a big mm -hmm. deal. Okay, mm -hmm. there was a girl yeah. that I had a on that was in the class. I was like, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, she's gonna be into this. She's in the front row. I'm just going to, you know, it's going to be perfect. All right. Uh, Vulnerability is an attraction strategy. <laughs> I was just going to mention that. Yeah. Yeah. You can like, be talking about it or not. <laughs> can I give you a quote that you're this? I just want to read something back to you that yeah, you wrote do it, Josh. about this. Okay. <laughs> okay. You said, okay. The only problem with surrendering yourself to psychological analysis in front of 20 people is that the part of you that likes getting psychologically nude in front of 20 people thinks it's stronger than the part of you that's actually going to be nude in front of 20 people. <laughs> some, would, some would say it takes guts to get that vulnerable. I don't agree. Getting vulnerable is the easy part. This is going to sound gross, but who cares? Vulnerability is an attraction strategy. <laughs> yeah, dude. That's that is good shit right there. Honestly, <laughs> that's good. That's really good. All right. So, so what does it mean? Like, so there was a girl in the room. Vulnerability yeah. is an attraction strategy. Vulner vulnerability as a oh, as yeah. a display. Oh yeah, yeah. As so, fizz. It's power. It's a power. It's 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 power because I mean you can get in front of people. The thing about acting is like and being on stage is it's a sort of there's a dis there's a safe distance between you and the other person and there's almost an like you're almost objectifying yourself in a way it's like i am this object that you are able that you're observing okay and so i'm up there and there's a safety it's not real relationship vulnerability it's different because it's still like okay like there's going to be something you're going to see about me i'm also going okay i got to compensate for what i don't have and so I'm like, I know one thing I can do freaking better than 90% of dudes out there is get up there and just bleed in front of people in a way that's uh, somewhat like, pow like people are going to, people, people are going to be able to consume it. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. almost yeah. Feeling like, like when I perform on stage, it's almost like, it's almost like Bermuda power. I don't know what my whole overlay is, but like, that's pop. That's a possibility. It's just interesting to me because basically when I go on stage, it, it, I just, it works. I don't want to be like, Oh, like I'm really good. But like, I do like, I like to play like the like character roles, like the side roles and just get all the glory. And it usually just works. Okay. Mm -hmm. So point is, yeah, I get in front of these, I get in front of the class. I'm always usually aware in front of an audience of like one person that I really want to like me. Mm -hmm. I'm like this person it's almost like the other stuff is just whatever there's white noise so they're just it's just a blur but like this one person i remember one time i got on stage like it was like march right before the pandemic hit i was like super i always like fall in love with girls during like theater like play stuff this has been my whole life okay um, <laughs> it's like double stage you know it's like oh so fun um i'm getting i'm jumping all over the place but we're talking about vulnerabilities and attraction strategy all right um we're talking about uh, the performance of vulnerability and maybe just bringing it back to that therapy session. I'll bring it back to the therapy yeah, session. Yeah. I was going afield. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So in that moment, what happened is I wasn't in control anymore in the Gestalt session, which yeah. is what exposed my heart. And that's, that's what, right. and that's what I'm kind of carrying and still processing and learning about is like when you yeah. get totally busted open at like the core of who you are, I mean, that damages your composure, not just like for like, you know, a couple hours. It's like, it's like, I don't know where this is going for me. Yes. It's shattering and, and, and the pieces don't fit back together like they used to. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it's very unsettling. And so you're like, oh, okay. Like I thought that like I was going to get out kind of with my skin on still like it on, but like I didn't, like I mm. kind of left people went with me. Like you're in a room full of empathetic people, like. People were wrung out the rest of the day, mm -hmm. but it's like, I didn't know how to put myself back together, especially the rest of that week. And I'm still trying to figure out like, okay, how do I like, this is real. This is a part of who I am. And I've been like, not wanting to fully know it Yeah, for a long time. Oh, I love that statement. I'm not wanting to fully, fully know it. Yeah. For a long time. Can you just be really specific like yeah um you began the the gestalt session and then f 
from and then just like the beats like what yeah. maybe there's five beats or something like that yeah. like what what happened yeah yeah, yeah yeah so so um person's looking at body language body language leads to the person saying um there's a feeling of loneliness a feeling of frustration yeah. where you live not connecting yeah. like your friends everybody that you live around being married right. where's the loneliness in your body the loneliness is everywhere all right let's look at the part of you that feels vulnerable look at the polarities one polarity is i feel like the person is performing the other polarity is this 12 year old boy okay this insecurity yeah. this like yeah. and, and it's like oh like when it went and so like identifying that and it's like oh i feel like that person all of the time like that 12 yeah. year old is in me all of the time and so it's that terrifying feeling as like a 31 almost 32 year old man where you're like i'm still a boy somewhere yeah and it's like humiliating because mm -hmm. you're like i should have dealt with this yeah and then you're dealing freaking dealing with it in front of 20 people and you're just like <sighs> yeah and there was also a chair right they yeah they so there was an empty, chair. This led yeah. to an empty chair exercise there you go and so okay. what the empty chair is it's just like kind of the what you think of when you think of like in therapy okay you're going to talk to your inner child and the inner child is going to be in this empty chair and you're going to be sitting opposite them and you're going to have to uh -huh. talk to them yeah and it sucks it is embarrassing <laughs> i'm freaking talking to this chair I don't want to, I don't want to see my 12 year olds. Like I look like a, I, this is the joke line. I always use. I look like a baby giraffe when I was 12 with braces. It's just like, I don't want to be identified with that kid who asked out some girl who's a cheerleader in sixth grade after calling for the buses and getting rejected and be like, I don't really have a boyfriend right now. I'm like, bullshit. Like you just dated some dude as a football player, like a week after I asked you out, you know, it's like still that wound where it's yeah. like, Oh, I'm this, I'm like the fugly 12 year old. And like, that's who I carry around, like that insecurity. And so it's like, okay, I like, if that's still in there and like that part of me also belongs, like I literally dude had to do like, what do you want to say to this person? And it's like, I was like, didn't even want to associate with him. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to have that conversation. I was pissed. I would made it clear. I was like kind of tossing some chairs around. It was like Jerry Springer with me, like my soul, you know, I'm just like, okay. Like I'm like having a Jerry Springer thing with like the inner family. And so I just like had to give this, like this 12 year old, like wanted a hug. I'm like, what is this? Like, I'm like right now I'm pushing. Cause I'm like trying to like, like kind of create safety by calling this like Oprah or something. But like the reality, like this was real. Mm -hmm. Like I'm like, yeah. Oh yeah. Like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm dying. Like uh, I need this. I need this from you. And I don't get it from you all the time because you're, you want me you think that you have to be entertaining and like supportive or empathetic or sensitive for people to love you or want you in their life. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's the condition. And if you can't perform at that level, then you can bail on relationship mm -hmm. with yourself, with other people. And so like that laid bare having to accept that part of myself was really important really hard and it's something i'm still learning and having to do because it's like doesn't want to penetrate yeah so let's that's where i want to go like how to what do you mean it doesn't want to penetrate and, I mean, and how do you ego, experience man, i mean being awake versus being asleep i think like there's something about the way the human ego is constructed with the defense mechanism where it's just sort of like don't let shit in like state, like, don't, like, don't, it doesn't want you to get awake almost. I don't know. Well, well, what I'm referring to more is like, <laughs> we, we talked before about, um, well, actually this is, this is a good time to read a different thing from what you wrote. This is, okay. we were talking before about mistyping as a four and, um, and how the, the defense mechanism, the seven was so unconscious, you didn't really realize it. All right. Uh, until now, when it's being really exposed, and particularly in the processing of this uh, experience you just had. Yeah, yeah. Here's here's what you wrote. You you said the resilience of this defense mechanism was so deeply unconscious. I mistyped as a four. I'm an introspective person. I thought I write, I read. I'm not consciously afraid of being unhappy or dissatisfied. I'm not afraid of sad books or sad movies or sad music. I'm a connoisseur of pain. 
Eye, There's the Rub, Connoisseur. This is Pain on Broadway, a glitzy, big-budget, live-action cartoon. Pain as pleasure, pain as experience, pain as edible energy. Which is, <clears throat> which is beautifully written. And this experience of having to meet your inner 12-year-old boy that you've kind of suppressed out of consciousness and moved to the other pole of being the entertainer kind of guy so you don't have to deal with this guy. This meeting the 12-year-old boy in you was pain as pain. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's a great way of putting it. Yes. yes. And and so and the, so I, what I'm sensing is that the defense mechanism, which is to, even as you're talking about it, move into 1.5x speed and um, uh, be really good at making mental associations and drawing metaphors and bringing in images of like Oprah or Jerry Springer and stuff like that, that all in real time is allowing you to rev the engine and then get back on the jet ski. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's this is reminding me of what, the we had our what, intro call where I was yeah. like, Will somebody have a breakdown on your podcast? <laughs> what was the what was the the emotional tone of when you just said mm-hmm? <laughs> what was that? It's just sort of this feeling of like where do you want do you want me to live there? That's what it feels like. I'm like that feeling. It's like, yeah, defense. Yeah, I'm defending myself. I'm like, do you want me to live there? Like, there's no air. There's no oxygen. It's the ocean. Yeah. I can't breathe. I can't yeah. breathe. <laughs> I can do it for like time, like short amount of time, you know? Go mm-hmm. down. You know, it's going to take a lifetime, however, whatever it is, you know, but... There is that. It's so difficult to. I was aware of feelings, real feelings in meditation and prayer within the last two years. But aside from that, aside from like breakdowns from specific life events was really good at pushing stuff away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, it's that weird thing, like, when you, like, meditate where it's, like, laughter and, like, crying. Like, (laughs) I just, that was, like, a spiritual discovery. I'm not saying, like, God only exists when I have a feeling or sensation. But, like, to me, it was a very, it was this weird way where, like, I was unclothed before some sort of my, my, my essential self. I feel like that's what prayer is. That's what meditation is. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, beautifully said, you know, just in this moment, I think what I'm really struck by is how confirmation bias functions so powerfully (laughs) because, you know, you were, so this is, it's now August 21st, 2022, and you discovered the Enneagram in 2018 and, um, the idea of thinking you were four for that long and reading description after description of type four and consuming that material and and feeling really pulled by that material and, um, and, and well consuming it. Yeah. You know, in the style of seven, it's edible in that sense. Yeah. And, and now kind of being slapped by the realization of like, Oh, Whoa, like this, this other thing was really going on this whole time. Um, Here's another thing you wrote. You said, life is sending me back to feelings school. It's kind of embarrassing. I thought I knew how to feel. Not only that, I thought feelings were my specialty. And then in italics, thought. (laughs) Which just that, and it's, I can't read the whole quote because it's too long, but in context, you were talking about being a a type in the thinking triad, you know. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. Um, is there a question at the end of that? Mm. I can just respond to part of it. Yeah. 
Yeah, let's do right. that. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. I mean, what the where the conflict comes in is in being like because the headspace is able to do language well, you can like conceptualize mm -hmm. like feelings and experience. You're like, here's the metaphor that like encapsulates, like that that captures what I've been feeling. Mm. Or, or here is this way yes. of speaking with somebody yeah. on a feelings level because I'm telling you about this feelings and quotes. Yeah, yeah. This feeling. Yeah. Whereas real feeling freaks me out. Yeah, there you go. Because it's like, there's not language that's like, for me, I don't know how to get there with words. People yeah, ask me how yes. you feel, and I'm like, I can't, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> you know, unconsciously, I just start talking. Like, I learned that through therapy, though. I didn't even know I was doing that. I always thought, oh, yeah, let me just tell you what's really going on. I'm so authentic. <laughs> Man, it is amazing. Yeah, this authenticity, vulnerability as per, as performance thing is like, um, is so clear in the way you're, you're describing it, you know, and then the, dropping into a feeling, which is really a, a pre-verbal kind of experience, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> Free verbals, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's that's what I'm processing. Right. I'm like, what does this look like to actually show up in this way appropriately in the world, like in relationship with feeling, or like even knowing when feelings are true? Mm -hmm. Holy crap. Because it's so confusing. This is what the, the whole guiding function thing with a headspace. Uh -huh. the seven has like this sort of way of like it heads the head center has a way of losing like touch with the guiding function yes which is sort of like knowing what's true it's almost like the narr like new impressions are replacing the old ones constantly right and so that is true of i have a feeling okay let's say i meet a girl i have this feeling of wow it's just like so great to talk to or like i just feel like like this person is like really great or there's some sort of let's just say uh spark well i'll go away from that Right. And then, you know, let's say I don't see that person interact with them or I, you know, I, I send them a message. I don't hear from them. New narrative comes up, new impression. Frustration goes, oh, OK, you know, it's just just whatever. This sucks. This person doesn't care. Whatever. I'm going to move away from this. Uh, move on, not feel it or create. OK, I have to try something harder, do better. All right. But like real feeling, like actually trusting a real feeling. Whoa. Like holding, like actually believing and holding on to like a, a a real feeling. That's something like I'm trying to learn. Like I want to, I want to learn. I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'm almost shocked that people actually feel stuff. Like, what's it feel like to be a from the heart set? I'm like, damn, what are you guys doing? <laughs> How are you alive? <laughs> You know, like, I'm like, how yeah. the hell is a, like, I hear from real fours. And I'm like, how are you not dead? Uh -huh. I talked to, <laughs> yeah. I talked to a real four on the phone with a real friend. I'm like, look, there's a buoyancy to my despair. When I spend time around a real four, if like they're staying at my place, I'm like, you need to go home now Uh huh. because they live there. Mm -hmm. I bounce from there. Mm -hmm. That's the fun part. That's four as funness Four, four energy as funness. Uh -huh. okay. The Enneagram is like a pro the process Enneagram. It's like, oh, four. I'm going to go to four. I'm going to go to four. <laughs> you don't go to four. I mean, <laughs> I don't know, man. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing down there, guys? <laughs> pull them out. I'm always trying to pull them out. I'm like, I'm like, wait, but there's hope. And they're like, no. Mm -mm. Like they're entrenched. Mm -hmm. And it's always shocking to me. So this is... What's so fun and amazing about talking to you right now is that this is so fresh for you, yeah. you know, having just realized it, you know, you're like, you're still sitting in the, in the, what the, the, the post, the post slap shock, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, um, what is your, what's your sense right now in your process of, of 
what will help you? Hmm. In terms of... Um, well, let me get really specific. So that feeling of, like when I asked you that question and you were like, mm-hmm, and then you were like, yeah, it's like, do you, are you asking me to live there? Do you want to, like, I, can, I feel like I can't breathe. That feeling, what, what's your sense of what will help you expand your window of tolerance for that feeling to be able to drop in there and breathe a little bit with it? Hmm. I think just, I don't know what, I mean, just kind of first off, like doing therapy is like good lab, but the problem is, is like, it's a lab, right? I leave the lab and I'm like, I'm really afraid of like, I guess relationship is the only real way. And then like also being alone and allowing yourself to slow down enough outside of just exclusive scheduled windows to feel stuff. Mm Mm-hmm. I have to really make space for that in my life where it's like not pushing over something or like not racing to the next thing to learn. Like I'm really good at fish. I'm really efficient with my time. I'm really bad at just being. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like feeling and being for me go together in a certain way because I'm not pushing. Uh And so... Uh I think allowing myself to be be myself without having to do something or to the thing is like even like spirituality can become performative where I'm just sort of like, all right, like like even like reaching for some sort of like 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 spiritual climax, you know, it's like, 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 like spirit, like sex and spirituality being so interlinked, even like a like counseling, like there's a very sort of like sexual, like when you're dissolving psychological boundaries, it's like a very sexual kind of energy in its own way. Sure. And so it's okay. almost like I said, being undone, it's almost like for me, what's the scariest part about it is like, when is it appropriate to allow yourself to be undone? And the thing is, is I will rationalize all of these times of when it's why I can't right now. That, yeah. And that is always, yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> yeah. I mean, it's just like, the thing is when you're like, when you're in a relationship and you're, you're seeing somebody like dating somebody, and it's not just like friends who you see like once a week or once every two weeks, that's when the real shit show, we have to actually start showing up. Like you can't like be in a long-term relationship and be, and that's why the longest relationship I've ever been in my life was 13 months. And there was a lot of long distance Okay. because if you're in a long-term relationship, you actually have to just be okay with just being in the same room as somebody. I never hard. really learned how to do that. Uh huh. And I think people can sense that, but I'm just sort of like, it's like you either are gone, like you need to go home or we're doing this. Fascinating. Okay, let's let's like go here. That's really interesting to me. <laughs> are you are you willing to? Oh, absolutely. Go here? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. So specifically with relationships, and this is part of your. I don't have the quote ready, but you were in your um in your thing you sent to me talking about friendships is like short form figure skating. It's like two hundred. It's like two minutes and forty seconds. You whip out the trips, the the the, the tricks. And then you strike a pose and then you're off the ice Yeah. Um, for whatever, you know, the hour that you're meeting a person for coffee or something like that. But in a relationship, there you are, Yeah. you know, and it's not, it's much, much longer than 240. Yeah. So this, this idea of just being with a person in the same room, what is hard about that what's threatening about that what makes, what's 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 anxiety provoking about that what's hard about it um yeah man everything uh it, to me it feels very connected to oneness like it feels like on a cellular level like your body doesn't know how to relax or let go that's what to me feels like like being people talk about being on you can't be on all the time in re- like a long-term relationship because it's so stressful. And it's if it's so stressful, 
being on, then that's why I need the person to go because I'm putting the expectation on me that to be in relationship, to be loved means I have to be on. If I'm not on, you don't want me. And I don't want me. I don't want me if I'm not on. That's, that's the freaking worst part, man. That's the lonely part where you're like, I'm so alone because I keep doing that to myself. Yeah, yeah. I have to say, one thing that is just amazing about speaking with you and reading your writing and stuff is just your facility with language about all this stuff is so, so good. Um, and, and yet that seems like a pretty entrenched problem. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like the, it's like the brighter the light, the darker the shadow, right? Uh, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's Robert Bly, whoever that is. Yeah, that's a beautiful. That's a good quote. Yeah, but I my point is is that you know your this is part of the type structure is that your ability to explain the thing isn't making the thing go away, but it is um, a, a very well developed skill that you've created for yourself because you've done all this thinking about feeling mm -hmm. yeah see this is the terrifying space josh where it becomes like oh this is why robin williams hangs himself you know i'm not robin williams but it's just sort of like that kind of shit okay yeah yeah like, hey, Kron like, was talking about that too like just the delaying of the pain that the delay yeah. the delay the delay yeah. yeah i mean that's what you see like that's where you know, it's a defense mechanism like yeah you hone this skill but it's the thing that isolates you from yourself in its own way uh, actually, I want to read one other thing you wrote here. Just I found this. I found this amazing. This um, well here. So type seven is the archetype of a generative mind. Energetically, seven is a spray. S O S X. What that looks like in terms of object relations is type seven is constantly spraying new narrative, new impressions, new reactions over the object. E.g., romance, job, whatever. Each new impression replaces the mood, tone, and atmosphere between subject and object. Just take that in for a second. This is partly what seven, what gives seven that ungrounded feeling. It's also what disables seven's contact with the guiding function. In average health, seven's inner compass is always spinning. Go this way, no that way, her, her, no wait, not her, her. Attached to frustration, seven's top layer says this object is not satisfying. Not only is this object not satisfying, but there's also something fundamentally wrong with the object that is not satisfying. And if I don't make a change right now, I'll be trapped in a state of maddening deprivation. <clears throat> what? <laughs> what are you doing, Josh? What are you... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that hurts. What what was amazing to me, I've never heard this language before, but just the idea of like, I'm always superimposing a new idea, image, mood, or something on top of the object that I'm relating to, whatever that is. And that constant like um, cognitive keeping that thing fresh through this act of superimposition is what actually prevents me from being in contact with the object and with myself in a deeper way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, it's terrifying. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah, I don't know. it's just like, you're never in a relationship with the same person because you're always, your, your opinion of them is always shifting or changing. It's just like, there's this one quote that I've attached to from this book by this writer named Richard Rohr. It's, uh, I insist uh -huh. on being worthy and deserving, and I demand the same from others, too. That's the whole thing to me. Mm -hmm. I'm insisting as a ground rule for just relating, period, that, that we're, that, to me, it comes down to that two center with relationship where it's just like, what are you bringing? What are you bringing to the relationship, right? I'm bringing all of this. And so it's constantly, are you bringing something like enough, like to, to like keep this alive? Cause if we're not playing at the highest level, then what are we doing? And that's why it's, 
I can be a good therapist, a good counselor, because all you do professionally is somebody leaves the room, you play at the highest level with them, you play with the next person, right? It's refreshing. It's that way. It's fine. It's safe. It's easy. But in real relationship, like to, 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 to treat yourself or somebody else that way is totally unsustainable. So I don't know what to do with that. Cause it's like, I'm doing work on myself. But it's work, you know, it's, it's it's still like I, I don't know eventually, maybe I'll just wear myself out, get old, and just and just sort of be better, be better, be a, a human being. And I, I'm getting better at it. I'm getting better at it. The last relationship I was in, I was at least able to address conflict a little bit better than I ever had before. Cause I mean, talk about the positive outlook thing. I thought that I was doing like emotional realness back to four stuff. I was like, oh yeah, I'm I'm real. Look at this. No. Yeah. No, I was backlogging stuff. I wouldn't bring it up. I go, okay, they're not playing up to the left. They're not playing. They're not bringing from that two space what I want. They're not like maybe saying words to me, like stupid love language stuff, words of affirmation. It's not stupid because it means a lot to me. Like I'm a words person. And so like, if I'm not getting that, I'm going, okay, you're not, that's seven stuff. You're not giving me what I need, but not saying to the person that I need this or that this dynamic is off, just sort of going, okay, it's something's wrong with me that I need that. Or um, I don't want to bring that up because it's going to make me seem needy. Uh, and so not dealing with it, not dealing with it, not dealing with it till it becomes a uh, deal breaker, you know, a, um, a an apocalyptic uh, dysfunction. And so then it's like, oh, yeah, this is a huge problem. And it's been a problem the whole relationship. And I can't do this anymore. And they're like, what? This is a, this is a total mind F, you know, yeah. That's, that happened to me couple times in my 20s and i was like is this i'm like why is like to me i would go like why is this a shock to you because this has been happening the whole time but i wasn't bringing stuff to the surface i was keeping it to myself until stuff mm -hmm. blew up now i was able to do that better in the last relationship that i was in but you know still obviously didn't work mm -hmm. out. yeah um this is a slightly different topic but it's going to relate um, yeah, yeah, yeah. to this and i think this i think this i don't want to lose the thread of this the relationship conversation because i think it's really fascinating and sure feels like it wants to ex i'm never gonna be in a relationship now because everybody hears this but this dude's freaking <laughs> <laughs> you might be surprised um <laughs> but yeah so because this is real vulnerability this isn't performative what's happening now um seven being so you have seven with the six wing and set and, and seven, one, two being your trifix. So you have six, one and two in your typing structure, three super ego types contrasted with seven. And that is, that is very interesting to me. I, I mean, just as a seven, seven being the type that in a sense gives themselves the most inward permission to do whatever. And then six one two, the types that give themselves the least, <laughs> um, and mm. I am curious about that dynamic in you. And I know that you were raised in a um, your dad is a pastor, right? Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, that's right. And you have uh, uh, religion is important to you, right? Your Christianity is important to you. Yeah, so I continue to go to yeah. a, a church. Yeah, I go to yeah. an Anglican church. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, so. Can you just talk about the how you experience that inner dynamic playing out, and and I wonder about its application in this relationship space. Oh boy, <laughs> yeah. So it's a war, man. It's an inner war. It's this feeling like with like what the thing is that's it's one and two gang up on seven for me a lot of the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know sure. yeah. the whole yeah. thing. i'm like i got two against one you guys suck like i'm about to flip the book off the camera because that's how i feel you know the seven is like you suck i hate you like like let me do what i want like why do i have to care um yeah. i'm going to do what i want to do and screw it screw it all and deal deal with it but the problem is is i got this soft ass conscience who is gonna come 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 catch up with me eventually and go all right you done bad. You done wrong. Uh, you gotta fix it. You gotta. Uh, you shouldn't have done that. 
you need to change this. You need to not do that. You need to need, 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 whatever. Just be, you know, it sucks. People will meet me and they'll be like, oh, you're just a good, like a good boy, good kid. I hate that. I'm like, you, I'm going to punch you in the face. I'm going to punch you in the throat. Like, <laughs> I, I hate, hate, hate it. Like, uh-huh. like it's disgusting to me. Like, I'm like, you don't even know who I am. But like I show up in the world, especially if I'm like in a professional setting, I'm like, just being nice. I work at a freaking elementary school. Uh, like, yeah, I'm not going to like be a dick to people. Like, I'm not going to be like, oh, yeah, let me do something. Like, I do fun seven stuff like Mr. Rogers style stuff. But it's like even like even like doing this interview, like I'm like, OK, like how much do I take the lid off? Because like I'm with my friends. I say whatever the hell I want. You know, I don't care. I'm the one in my family who like I love to swear. It's fun. I don't I don't care. I have no compunction about that. I'm like, what? Say it's fun. There's a musicality to it. Yeah. I'm pissed talking about this, but I'm like, I get sick. I'm like, do not put a lid on this. This is what it means to be a person. Like, if I can't do this, it's like people say, well, if you can't, you can't really joke about death. Joke serious. Death is serious. Well, if I can't joke about death, I don't even want to die. It's the same thing. Uh-huh. It's, a, it's the same freaking thing here. Yeah. Like, if I can't, like, this is why I do a lot of the writing stuff. I just, can go all out and do crazy shit. And I'm like, I'm going to just do anything, anywhere I want to go. Nobody can tell me what to, what's moral or fence me in or do something. I'm like, that's not what art is. I don't do that. I go, I, I don't make stuff for children. I make stuff that looks like it's made for children. That's freaking not. <laughs> People look at my aesthetic. They're like, what, what is this? But it's just like, that pisses me off too. I'm like, just because it doesn't look like this is uh, freaking... I don't know. Some I don't, like I've got friends who write straight up just darkness. And I'm like, just cause it doesn't look like that doesn't mean there's not depth to it too. Like that pisses me off too. Like the seven stuff of two. I'm like, I'm like, no, there's depth in the stuff that I make. Mm-hmm. Don't tell me that there's not, but I don't even know what I'm talking about right now, Josh. Cause you asked about the super ego. Well, I'm tuning I'm, into I'm it. Defensive. I'm getting defensive. I'm t- no, actually. Well, that's not my experience. My experience is that you are tapping into a kind of, well, an, an anger that is the result of um, it's toward myself a, too of being trapped in this pol- inner polar. Speaking of polarity, is the Gestalt thing. It's like you have this um, super ego <laughs> restriction, inner restriction that causes you to, in a sense, um, run into a, a guilt leash about any form. If you, if you, if you go too far into the realm of like absolute freedom of self-expression externally, right. Yeah. In the external yeah, yeah. world. Yeah. That you also have this really strong core party, the seven part that is like, no, like basically I want to, you know, fuck everyone. <laughs> like I want to yeah. just, I, I'm going to just spew it out. Yeah. But the, that's, that's a really rich, alive inner conflict. And I get the anger. I mean, I, I can see why that's really frustrating. Yeah. So it, it, it's just like, it's weird because there's this real terror of letting go. And that could be related to even to instinctual stacking, like SPS. Okay. Stuff. Yeah, that, yeah um, that makes sense. But uh, for instance, like I had this real phobia of drinking. Like my uncle was an alcoholic, but I never, I never had a beer in my life till I was like 23 or four. It wasn't like for like some rule. I was not like, it wasn't like people like I went to like a school where like people wouldn't drink on principle, like some Baptist thing. Hell no. I, no, it was not a moral thing. Like my people, in my family drink or whatever. That's fine. It was not the thing. I just had this sense of like, I have this fear sometimes of like, what if I like, what if I drink? I'm going to become an alcoholic. You know, it's almost like that. Like it's like the one and two, just like policing the seven. It's like, Oh, watch, yes. oh, watch out for that one. Yes. Gonna, yeah. Policing. Gonna, yeah. Cause he's going to go all the way. Once you get a taste, he's just going to, he's just going to go bananas. And so what I do, the way that I let get my rocks off is I, it's like creatively I am drugs. That's how I, it's that Dali quote. That's what I do. That's my, I let myself off the leash there, but there is a way that like my life SPSO wise is like very structured, even like in terms of like how I like maintain touch with like creativity. I'm like, Oh no, 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 don't mess with like the system because this is what's keeping me on the planet meaning like there's an appropriate time and place where you unleash yourself and there's like i mean the way that i built my life like we were talking about off uh, you know before we started recording or whatever like like doing theater stuff that was a big part of my creative life up through being 22 years old like i would write plays too and i would perform i would get to direct them or act in them like in college and i love that love connecting with people making that stuff happen 
I finished college and I was like, I really have to keep making stuff because that's what makes me feel alive and like what I'm interested in about being a person. But I uh, don't really want to move to a major city. I don't know that like I'm going to be able to keep doing the theater stuff. It's going to suck if I'm going to do in the like, community theater stuff with a bunch of yahoos. Not fair, but like that was the general feeling. So I was like, okay, I have to like, what can I do by myself? I have to become a one man band. And so I just hunker down to, okay, what do I like to read? And I realized that I'd start, I liked reading contemporary fiction when I was 22. And so I was like, I'm going to write the kind of thing that I like to read. And so that's what I did. I hunker down into that lifestyle. I like, it was a conversion. I gave my life to that. And that freaking destroyed me at 27 or so. And that's didn't work. <laughs> uh, I don't get it. Yeah. So, I mean, like I, I gave my life to like get like get getting success creatively in terms of like writing. Like I like to okay. did a lot of fiction writing or mm -hmm. whatever. And I was like, okay, eventually I'm going to break through. Cause I always have before that's the story. Um, so if I just work hard enough at this and I send a bunch of stuff out, then eventually I'm going to get through. Well, it, it just didn't happen. It didn't, it. it didn't happen. Yeah. And I was like, what I had to reconcile with at that moment was, is like, I had nothing. What I gave my life to didn't work. I was alone. I had chosen something that isolated myself habitually by like, you know, I get up in the morning, whatever I get up at like 4.40, 4.45 or five. And I do an hour and a half, two hours, whatever of writing. I like just plug in, do that six days a week, whatever it's going to be. I do that really consistently. That is remarkable. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah go on. Yeah, it's, just, it's just what I do. It's like exciting to me to get up. I get to do that every day. But like my relationship with creativity really changed after I couldn't, like we talked about seven being generative. I couldn't generate stuff because I didn't, I was so lost and broken as a person that I didn't want to be, a, I didn't want to be here. Like, I was like, there's no point. I just was done. I was done. It was like everything that had worked for me no longer worked. I was alone. I had failed creatively. My relationships had failed and I didn't know how to get out of it. It was like, I dug this hole. It's like that seven thing. I like dug this hole. I'm like, there's going to be gold down here. There's going to be gold. <laughs> Six years later, there's just a fucking deep well. There's no goddamn gold down here. And that was four or five years ago? Yeah, man. It was like fall of 20, I guess, seven, 17 where like that happened. The bottom fell out. Yeah. Um, and then what happened? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the real turning point was I couldn't, I couldn't write, couldn't write. And uh, I was like, but I was like, I got to make stuff. I got to make stuff. It was like that seven defense. I was like, I can't stop moving. And so it was weird because what happened is, is I got pulled into like, basically I was like the way that I'm seeing myself is not the way that God sees me, but I didn't know that the whole time. Like, it's like, so just like, whatever you want to say, like whether you believe in God or not, like it's like on some sort of ex like deep level, like the way that I'm seeing my whole being was adversarial. Like there was a way that like, I was just not cutting it. I was not able to be my first introduction to being to spirituality was when I couldn't do, I had to be. And what, I, what that looked like in a demonstrable way for me was through this practice of making this series of poems out of this children's book that I found in, a, found in a library in the church that my dad was a pastor at at the time. Okay. I found this book from 1951 called Questions Children Ask. Mm -hmm. And I remember picking this book up like a year before I did anything with it and finding it very strange. Uh, everything I hate about evangelicalism uh, and that I struggle with about Christianity. And I was like, this is perfect. It's disgusting leave it to beaver like literally straight up like 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 weird stuff and but it was like i had this weird kind of chemistry with it spark and so i took this i started cutting this book up because i was and i was receiving these words from the book in, in, in a way where i wasn't creating this i was a part of a process where i was i was a little c that was contributing or participating in capital c creativity Mm -hmm. that was real that was i like that was real relationship with with uh being capital b being it was like sure like i am just showing up here in complete total faith i have nothing to bring 
I have nothing that I'm bringing. I'm purely just receiving what there's nothing I have that I've not received from heaven. And that is like sort of like words that I live by before I start to work every day, where it's just like, there's a way that like that, that that's what to, to create something is you're participating in a process. I'm not, it's not, a you know, it's about, it's me as a person. Yeah. Sam is a lens. He's a specific lens. It's not like, I'm like, just like, I'm just whatever. It's like, no, I have a specific thing that I can do, but like, what's the good that's coming through is, is almost like what's like, it's a come, it's just like, a, it's traveling through me. I'm not in control of it. It's a surrendering. And so that to me is what spirituality is. Mm-hmm. And that was a huge, that saved my life. Amazing. That saved my yeah. life because, and that changed my whole relationship with creativity because up to that point, it was like, I have to make it. I have to make it. Mm-hmm. The story is that I make it. Mm-hmm. I didn't make it. Like my whole first half of my life, I made it. Uh huh. And then it stopped. And it was like, even we're talking about, it's weird talking about personality. It's like, I even look at stuff in my life, like, like, like high school. Like I was like, this is disgusting. Like high school does stuff like in the yearbook. It's like best personality. Yeah. Well, jokes on you, dude, best personality. Guess what? I wanted like that defense mechanism or whatever that is. That stuff is what buried me. It's like when you get broken in that way, humbled, you're like, yeah, best person freaking malady. Like it's just me in this room with like, with with god and i am on my knees Mm -hmm. i'm done Mm -hmm. because it's not work what i've been how i've been living it it it, 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 it had stopped working i had a new way of living or i wasn't gonna keep living i'm i'm fascinated by a couple things about it first of all just your your level of activation and energy in telling the story is interesting to me um (laughs) that um We got a psychopath preacher on our hands. <laughs> <laughs> this dude's a psycho. Here. No, there's just the clearly a lot of life force in that um, in that story, and it, I'm also fascinated from the point of view that I stories where people hit a kind of bottom and they're at the end of the rope, and then find something that um, helps them reconstitute their life in a way that has meaning in a different way. Yeah. Um, that's always very fascinating to me. And what, what, f- what failed at, in that moment where you said you were, my understanding of your story is that you had been pushing f- mm. to towards some end and the end is what, like success as a creative writer or, um, something like that. And prob- my, I was also hearing notes of like that loneliness theme is kind of underneath everything in a sense, like what what success meant was um being uh well um all the things that success brings whether that's um true people who believe in you friends women oh, yeah. maybe you know like all yeah, that stuff yeah it's yeah. still really love me now yeah yeah that's right it's like yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. it was it was it was the ones who are the special ones will find me now that okay, was okay the yeah was there you go yeah and that failed and and so you had to meet yourself in a different way. And, um, and this creative project uh, allowed you to surrender part of your, uh, I don't know, your ego or your, do- your creative doingness yeah. and then move into a more kind of channeling space or yeah. um, receiving space or something like yeah, that. Yeah, totally. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I don't know how to place that in terms of seven, one, two, six, and it yeah, doesn't really sure. matter to me, but whatever. Um, that's, that's a, it's a cool mo- life moments. I mean, I'm sorry that you went through it, but also these moments where we break open and then have to refine ourselves are really powerful. Yeah. Yeah, man. I don't know. It's interesting because I had always framed that stuff from the four place. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's so interesting about that narrative. And I was thinking about trying to see that from seven space and it, it sort of, here's, here's was, one crack at it. Here's yeah. like the crack is like as a seven, I'm wanting, um, you know, I have a fantasy of the things that will nourish me. Yeah. Um, the special people will find me. The women will love me The whatever. And six, one, two, um, doing, going about getting that fantasy in a way that is, sanctioned by my super ego it's it's through 
it's through writing. It's through um, it's through uh, being a devout Christian. It's through being a you know whatever. Uh, like the yeah, structure for- of my life and the way that I'm going about it are appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, dude. David Gray also told me this is hilarious. He's not going to mind if I say this, but he told me, he said, he said, if you got married right now and had a baby, it would be a disaster. He said, you would be angry. It would be a terrible thing. Because like all my friends, that's how their lives have gone too. That's the name. Yeah, yeah. And so he's like, uh-huh. he's like, he's like, that wouldn't work for you. And I'm just sort of laughed about it. And he was just like, it was connected to a bunch of other stuff, but it was just interesting to me because it was like, yeah, he would just straight up told me that. It's like very freeing, but also like. Because I always yeah. carry that narrative as like a solution to like my uh, sc- like self sabotaging life. That it's like, how do I stop living in this way that's both painful and free? And I'm like, oh, eventually I'm just gonna like I'm gonna snap into the family narrative and I'm gonna get married and I'm gonna have a family. Oh uh, wow! You no, know, it's that traditional like that's that freaking super ego stuff too. It's like people are like, I'm almost the only one that knows my life isn't gonna be conventional. <laughs> wow! Yeah. Um, I keep telling myself, oh, it's going to snap together. No, it's fucking not. <laughs> this is, I ha- um, this feels relevant to how or why it's difficult to be alone with a person in a room. Oh, yeah? Uh, Tell me more. Because if, well, how do I say this? Um, It feels like there's it feels like there's this inner conflict in you that is just on the one hand wanting to perform and be loved and uh meet expectations um and another to be free to do whatever you want and um the the sense of like having to be on with a person is a is a sh- is a showing to them of the part of you that is um that can be that can perform and meet expectations and be lovable and stuff like that and a hiding i think of the part of you that wants to do what you want Hmm. Yeah, probably. <laughs> so, yeah. So I could see. So I could see why, like, being alone in a room with a person for, for example, a week, and you're just spending a few evenings together. Like, you've already exhausted all your tricks and and. <laughs> You know, you've like told all your stories and told all your jokes and stuff. And now you're just sitting on a couch next to this person. Like, what do you want to do now? I don't know. You know, that, that space of the, I don't know. Um, yeah. That's just interesting. summed up my whole life, man. <laughs> that, that little thing. That's like my whole, that's like the whole thing. I don't know what you just said. Yeah, Yeah, I don't want that to be forever. So I'm just trying to figure out a different way to live. And I'll say it a slightly different way. It's almost like the super ego part of you is what you are willing to um, present as acceptable or lovable. It's the part of it. It's this. It's like, hey, look, this is the part of me that stays within certain lines. Oh, yeah. You know? Um, but there's a lot of life force in this other direction, which was partly like the level of activation and anger that you were expressing earlier when you were telling all those stories, um, that hasn't found a full release valve yet and feels I like internal. I just do it creatively, but right yeah, yeah, yeah. Hasn't found a, hasn't found a relational release valve. Hasn't found a, a release valve in the context of a, um, a stable relationship. Sure. Where it's allowed to be there. You know, yes. that energy is, yeah. Yes, well, it's super damn complicated because it's like, okay, do, am I even attracted to Christians? Mainly not. Last person I dated was not a Christian. Um, mm-hmm. 
So that's its own stupid thing. I don't know what to do with that either. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how do you, how are you feeling right now? Yeah, man, I think this is a good conversation. I feel like we touched a lot of different pieces of this. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like I, I left it all out in the field. Yeah. You did. <laughs> Somewhat. You really yeah. did. Yeah. yeah, you really did. Yeah. And, and my experience of it was that it was, it was real. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't authenticity as performance. It was real. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really like talking to you and I really appreciate you. And it's pretty crazy that I got to listen to your show and then get to be a part of this because it's really an important part of my life. So that means a lot. It means a lot to hear you say that. Um, Thank you for doing this and really for being willing to go here at where we went. And also just being willing to, especially having just exposed yourself in front of 20 people now kind of do the same thing again. (laughs) Um, You know, put yourself in the hot seat and just have this be, let this be part of your process. So, and I know I've been thinking it's really fresh and you're just figuring a lot of stuff out right now. And um, I'll be curious to hear how things go. Yeah. Thanks, Josh. All right. Thank you too, man.